Good morning all. This is my 8-bit breadboard computer and uh, a little while ago I made a video about how I'm creating literal data. So I've got a little uh, sort of shift register thing here. It's a nibble shift register. Anyway, it works. It creates 8-bit literal data. And here it is powered up and you can see that I'm alternately creating the data 5A with A5 and writing it to my little display latch here but when I first wired up this latch and started clocking it from one of my address decoders it didn't work I was getting spurious data on the display there was something wrong and I had a hunch that it might be a double trigger it looked to me like it was triggering at two different times when it should only have been triggering at one time now at that time I wanted to make a video about this literal data so I didn't really have time to properly diagnose what was going wrong so I just applied standardized solutions to the problem. The first one was to put decoupling capacitors in that's kind of the go-to first thing you would do. So I had these 100 nanofarad capacitors these big uh, green polyester ones they've got long legs so they can span across VCC and ground on these 20 pin chips. And you can see I put one there, one here, one here, uh, there's one down here on this latch. I put them everywhere I, where I felt there might be a problem, but they didn't do anything. That didn't fix the problem. And in fact, I could probably pull them all out and this thing would uh, probably still work. So the second thing I did was the, it was this latch here that I was having the problem with. So I put in line with the clock signal going to that latch, a resistor. Now initially I put 10k in there and that fixed it. That fixed the problem and I must admit I wasn't entirely sure why that fixed the problem. I changed the 10k to a 1k and in fact it's got a 1k in there now and then it didn't work again so I added a capacitor to ground at the um, far end of the 1k forming an RC network. It's actually a low pass filter and once again, that worked. So the low pass filter fixes the problem, but I'm not entirely sure why. And for the moment, I'm not that bothered. I think it's my background in field service engineering that um, makes me able to apply a solution without really knowing what the exact nature of the problem is, because at that time, fixing machines was far more important than fully understanding what the problem was. So you just applied standardized fixes. But I will go back and look at this because I do want to know what the problem is with this multiple triggering of this latch. I'll need to get the scope on it. I don't have a logic analyzer, so I'll just uh, have to use the oscilloscope. It's all I've got. So I will look at this and what exactly is the problem. But for the moment, my solution is working fine. And in fact, this video is not really about the 8-bit computer. This video is about decoupling capacitors. So here's another view of the decoupling capacitors. Generally you put them directly across VCC and ground and you also connect them as close to the active component, the device that's taking the energy, as possible. So you can see in all these three cases, oh, there's another one in there actually, I've got them strapped directly across ground and VCC which are pins on opposite corners of the chip. So what exactly do decoupling capacitors do? Well, they provide a localized source of energy or power um, closely coupled to the chip. Now that means that it, it's a low impedance connection. It's low resistance. The connection between this chip and say the battery pack, I'll have to zoom out to show the battery pack. It's over here. This is high impedance because we've got long traces lots of these links with the resistive connections in the breadboard running all the way from the chip back to the battery that has resistance it also has inductance there are lots of twists and turns in these various connections so this is a high impedance connection between that chip and the ultimate power supply these batteries but it's a very low impedance connection between this capacitor and this chip so when this chip requires a lot of current for a very short period of time it's the capacitor that provides it and then the capacitor recharges through this high impedance path from the batteries. Now what about the name decoupling capacitor or even bypass capacitor? 
Well, their names for the actual、um, use of having a capacitor very close to this chip. If this chip draws a sudden and very short burst of current, without that capacitor, it could pull the power supply lines down momentarily and affect the operation of another part of the circuit through the power supply. Now, those two parts of the circuit may not actually be connected in any useful way, but one can impact the other. Because of droop or drops in the voltage on the power supply, by having these closely coupled capacitors, you can eliminate this coupling, this connection between different parts of the circuit, which you don't actually want. Now, whether you refer to these capacitors as decoupling capacitors or bypass capacitors, or in fact any other name, their use is to provide, as I say, a low impedance, high energy, high power power supply. To a device which periodically and not that often requires a large burst of power or energy. And now I'm going to go outside because outside I've set up something very similar to this, but on a much larger scale. And here's the setup that I've got outside, which on the face of it can't actually work. What I've got here is a 12 volt. 10 watt LED connected to this、uh, PIR detector, passive infrared detector, and it's connected to a 12 volt battery by a long piece of wire, which runs around the garden, along here, along this hedge, past all these rather nice bluebells. I think that's what they are, and then down here along the side of the house, and round to the back garden. Now, at the back, that pair of wires ends up here at this connecting block, and goes to these two wires, which go down to a 12 volt car battery. And I'll just、uh, show that. So ultimately, the two wires come out of、uh, that little glass panel there, plastic it is actually, and go to this car battery, which is being held continuously charged by a solar panel and solar charge controller. So that's sitting at about 13 and a half volts. But it's a long way from that PIR light, which is round the front of the house, about 20 meters away. Now, most of the cable run between the car battery round the back here and my PIR light is this stuff, and it's CCA conductor, which is copper coated aluminium, and this is quite high resistance. In fact, it's about one ohm per meter, and that's why, on the face of it, this thing. Can't actually work because let's say that's a 12 watt LED. It's a 10 watt, but let's call it 12 watt to make the calculation easier. Well, that's one amp. So this, when it switches on, and I can make it switch on actually, if I can、uh, block the daylight out. Let me have another go at that. Okay, I just needed to block the、uh, direct sunlight from this PIR sensor, but yeah, that's come on. So that's drawing one amp. Now we've got twenty meters of one ohm per meter cable. Well, that's twenty ohms. So for every meter of this cable, one amp flowing through it will drop one volt. So once we get past twelve meters, there's no volts left because the battery round the other side. Okay, well maybe it's thirteen and a half. When we get to thirteen and a half meters of this cable. We've dropped thirteen and a half volts, so you can't run a one amp light from a power supply, which is twenty meters away, when you've got one ohm per meter of resistance. So how does it work? Well, the answer is under this panel. So let me just take the screws out of this. This is just a rain cover. And the answer is a locally positioned capacitor. So this is a supercapacitor block, so that it can take the、um, 12, 13, 14, whatever it is, volts from the car battery that's 20 meters away. This charges slowly over that high-resistance cable. It's the pair of grey wires that you can see there, but it's connected locally with this proper copper cable. To my PIR sensor, and that PIR sensor only comes on for short bursts. 
it's set to about 20 seconds. Now, I don't know what the maths is of this thing, but it works absolutely perfectly, providing, in a sense, the same effect as a decoupling capacitor. It's locally placed to a high current draw, but that high current is only required for short bursts. And this capacitor solution works perfectly. Now this setup with the PIR uh, sensor, the little 10 watt LED lamp, the super capacitor, and then this long cable running 20 meters or so around to the other side of the house to that big car battery has been set up for well, at least a couple of weeks and it's absolutely flawless. The cats trigger it um, several times a day human beings trigger it once or twice a day but because of the nature of this this load which is short bursts of relatively high power but for very little time something which is much like an, a decoupling capacitor works completely perfectly so there's my supercapacitor block um, it's six 120 farad capacitors in series so it's 20 farads um, in total. Now there is a little bit of corrosion starting to appear around some of those blobs of solder but um, I'm just very interested to see how long this thing lasts sitting under a very crude rain cover and providing local energy for my 10 watt LED. Now I wanted to do the maths of the energy drawn by the light and the energy in the capacitor to see whether they think things kind of tie up. The light is 10 watts and it runs for about 20 seconds. So what seconds would be 10 times 20, which is 200 watt seconds, which is joules. Now, of course, as the voltage on the capacitor starts to fall, it probably isn't 10 watts, so that probably falls down. So I'm just going to knock this back a bit and call that one 50 watt seconds for one burst of activity on that LED. And from my experiments, it seems that you can get about three re-triggers before the voltage on the capacitor block falls so much that the LED just goes really dim. So one trigger, 20 seconds, let's say it's about 150 watt seconds. Now the energy in that capacitor block is half C, which is uh, 20 farads, V squared. Now the V squared, of course, is only going to be the usable voltage range. And I'm thinking it's probably usable from about 13 volts down to 10 volts. So we've probably got about three volts of usable range there. So three squared is nine, C is 20 farads and a half. So it's 10 times 9 equals 90 joules. So by these very rough calculations it looks like the capacitor has about 90 joules in it and for each trigger we need about 150 joules to keep the lamp on. So something here is not quite right mathematically. Maybe I have to derate this further because the um, LED brightness perhaps drops quite quickly. It's very hard to see and it certainly looks bright but um, I mean the figures are sort of ballpark the same but yeah I'm not quite sure why the maths doesn't quite work but the unit does and it works beautifully. And uh, yeah that's just got me thinking what is the start voltage on this capacitor? Well it's higher than 13. I've got 13.2 seven there and it's creeping up ever so slowly as this capacitor recharges through that high resistance cable from the battery around the other side. Let's see how quickly that drops once I trigger this light. Let's see if I can trigger it. Yep, that's triggered it. And that falls away pretty quickly. As I say that light stays on for about 10 seconds, so down to 12 volts. That's why the lamp's still bright because it's designed to run at 12 volts. hasn't clicked off yet, we're down to 11.6. Oh, that must have gone off. Yeah, that has gone off. So that's now creeping back up. So it only gets down to about 11.5, which is why the LED stays bright. 
And then as this capacitor recharges, which it does at a much more modest pace, it actually gets well above 13 volts. I'll just um, sit and watch this for a while. Yeah, so this recharge is quite slow, and that's kind of how decoupling capacitors work. They recharge slowly, and then the energy is pulled out of them really quickly when the load is triggered. I'm going to trigger it again, actually. Okay, that's on again. See how low I can get this thing to fall. I'm obviously not hearing that click very well when it cuts off. So down to 11 point. That's it, that's gone off. Let's trigger it again. Got to block the light from that sensor. And I notice when the voltage on that lamp gets down to about 10 volts, it really does get very dim indeed. So this time round, that's it, it's gone off. So how bright is it now? Well, it still seems pretty reasonable. It's hard to tell in daylight. But yeah, I mean, it's workable even after three or four re-triggers. We are now getting down to voltages where that LED is going to start to get dim. But as I say, in practice, this works very well. So that's my large scale outdoor decoupling capacitor application. We've got a, a high power load, but which is only used occasionally. A locally placed super capacitor, which is that uh, local energy store. And then a recharge me mechanism for that capacitor, which is high impedance or high resistance mostly in this case, back to that car battery, which is 20 meters away. And it works. And I'm happy. Cheerio.